Water is a resource we cannot live without. It is essential to life. We know that 70% of the Earth's surface is made up of water, but less than one half of 1% of that is available to us as fresh water in rivers, lakes, and the ground. It is essential that we manage this water wisely so that it remains available to us for the several functions it provides, including drinking, sanitation, irrigation, manufacturing, recreation, supportive ecosystems, power generation, making beer, the list goes on and on. According to the United Nations, every continent on Earth is now experiencing water shortages. And four billion people experience severe water shortages at least one month of the year. The rate at which we're using water continues to grow, and we're now reaching the limit at which we can sustainably deliver this resource in different parts of the world, especially in arid regions. It's for all of these reasons that it's somewhat surprising that pollution of waterways continues to exist, and not just in developing countries, but in the United States as well. If there's some consolation, it's in the fact that we're quickly learning how to better manage our water resources. We've made significant progress in restoring some of the more abused waterways across the world. Good morning. My name is Kevin Fitzpatrick, and I work for the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago as an engineer. Now, when I was growing up, I always envisioned I would be a baseball player when I got older, for the White Sox, of course. But as I started to grow and the baseball talent didn't follow, I knew a backup plan was needed. So my high school guidance counselor suggested I go into engineering. And I had no idea what engineers did, but having no realistic alternative of my own, engineering it was. So I attended the University of Illinois, where I learned that engineers generally use STEM to help make this complex civilization we've created function much better, and that there are all different kinds of engineers. Because I love the environment, I decided to specialize in environmental engineering, which is where I learned all about water and how to manage it. The agency I work for now is responsible for treating the wastewater generated by more than 5 million people in Chicago and 124 of the suburbs. Now, as you can imagine, there's a lot of really disgusting things flushed down the toilet every day that need to be safely removed before we can return this water to the environment. So the water in Chicago is actually cleaned twice within a couple of days. Once when the city of Chicago takes it out of Lake Michigan and cleans it to drinking water standards, and then again by our agency after it's flushed down the sewer system and treated at one of our plants. One thing that's really amazing to me is how relatively new this field of water treatment is. So as an analogy, Carl Benz received a patent for his invention of the gasoline power motor back in 1886, and by 1908, Henry Ford had started mass assembling the Model T, making cars relatively affordable and much more common in the United States. Now, it wasn't until four years after that when the city of Chicago began any sort of water treatment at all, which simply involved adding chlorine to the water supply to its 2.2 million residents at the time. And it wasn't until 1947 when they built the wa first water filtration plant. Similarly, the wastewater from this booming metropolis was simply discharged to the nearest waterway without any treatment at all. And it wasn't until the 1930s when we built our water reclamation plants to clean this sewage before returning it to the rivers. So how did this booming metropolis continue to thrive without any wastewater treatment or drinking water treatment until the early 1900s? by constructing one of the largest projects at the time, the, uh, excuse me, by constructing one of the largest public works project of the time, which was uh, reversing the flow of the Chicago and Calumet rivers to send the polluted water away from the lake rather than towards it. So how is this possible though, to, to reverse the flow of a river? A lot of people have heard this, but, but how is it actually possible? Now, most people, because Chicago is relatively flat, most people might not realize that there's actually a mid-continental divide 
that's just to the west of the city that separates the Great Lakes basins from the Mississippi River basins. And that if it was to rain right on top of this divide, you might have a raindrop that falls just to the west of the divide, makes its way eventually into the Des Plaines River, and then the Illinois River, and then the Mississippi River, and then out into the Gulf of Mexico. Meanwhile, during the same storm, just a foot to the east, a raindrop might hit on the other side of that divide and end up in the Chicago River and then out toward Lake Michigan through the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence Seaway out into the Atlantic Ocean that direction. So by constructing canals across this divide, we essentially were able to connect the Chicago and Calumet Rivers to the Des Plaines River and send our waste away from Lake Michigan. Now, fortunately for the downstream communities, we now have the technology to clean this water before we send it their way, and they have the technology to clean it again before consuming it. Many people confuse our agency with the Chicago Department of Water Management, which is responsible for the drinking water. But there's a very big difference between how we treat wastewater and how they treat drinking water. They take a fairly clean source of water out of Lake Michigan and make it safe for consumption. We take a very dirty source of water out of the sewer and make it safe to return to the environment. Now, imagine yourself as a water molecule just hanging out in Lake Michigan on a nice, beautiful summer day like today. You might be inquisitive and you might go check out this intake crib thing. You get a little too close and all of a sudden you find yourself being sucked through a tunnel and you end up at the Jardine Water Purification Plant in downtown Chicago, right next to Navy Pier, where you'll flow through a series of tanks, pass some sand particles, and then all of a sudden you're shot out through some pumps into the city of Chicago through a large network of distribution pipes going left, right, up, down, back, forth, in, out, all over the place until finally you end up in a nice, bowl somewhere where you can relax, catch your breath, try and figure out where you are, try and figure out what just happened to you, and try and figure out how this day could possibly get any worse. Well, just as you're doing that, you look up and you can't believe the disgusting things being thrown down on you. A flush later, you're in a whole different set of pipes. This is our sewer network now. You're flowing around, passing all kinds of disgusting things, smells in there, you got rats waving at you as you go by. Finally, you make your way to one of our water reclamation plants where we'll pump you up to the surface, we'll clean you up pretty good, send you from tank to tank to tank, get you nice and clean, then discharge you out into the waterway where you can finally relax and flow down down toward the Gulf of Mexico for a much needed vacation. That is, unless a downstream community or maybe the Budweiser plant in St. Louis don't suck you out of the Mississippi first. So in a relatively short amount of time, we, we reversed the flow of a couple of rivers. We built a large network of sewer systems, some greater than 25 feet in diameter. We built sophisticated treatment plants to remove the pollutants from the water. Meanwhile, our peers at the city, they tunneled out under Lake Michigan a half a mile where they built intake cribs. They constructed two of the largest water purification plants in the world, and they built thousands and thousands of miles of distribution piping and large pumping stations to deliver clean water to the millions of residents and businesses in Chicago. Now, while our predecessors, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, yeah, while our predecessors were up to the challenge addressing these tasks, they left some more modern uh, challenges for us to deal with today. One of the largest issues we're dealing with is how to mitigate the flooding and pollution caused from some of the larger, more severe, and frequent rainstorms that are occurring that can often overwhelm our infrastructure. So because Chicago is relatively flat, it has very clay soils that were never really good at absorbing water in the first place, which is why we were a swamp. Paving over these areas, you know, with our roads, our sidewalks, our homes, our businesses, 
It's really left the water no place to go when it rains, which is why we have several problems. So for the last few decades, we've been building tunnels and reservoirs at an unprecedented scale in Chicago to try and capture this rainwater that's mixed with combined sewage and causes that otherwise would cause environmental degradation or back up into people's homes and businesses. Now the tunnels themselves stretch from the north suburb of Wilmette all the way to the south suburbs of South Holland. They're up to 300 feet below ground and 33 feet in diameter. They generally follow underneath most of the major waterways and they end up discharging into two of the largest reservoirs in the world. Yet even with this infrastructure in place, we still have problems during major storms. So now the focus in Chicago and several other areas is on using green infrastructure to mimic natural processes, uh, retaining water where it falls and, and, and keeping it there using natural systems rather than flushing it out to the sewer systems. Examples of green infrastructure include rain gardens, bioswales, permeable pavement, and rainwater harvesting systems. Green infrastructure can be very effective in helping to relieve some of the burden on our gray infrastructure. Uh, green infrastructure can reduce flooding. It can help improve water quality. Individual green infrastructure projects tend to be on the much smaller scale size than some of the tunnels and reservoirs that I showed you earlier. But as we start incorporating these practices throughout our developed area, the, the cumulative effect can become quite significant. And this is just one example of how we can create a more sustainable future. So far, I've described just a few of the challenges that we're dealing with in the water resources engineering field, but there are so many more. And each one presents an opportunity. Whether it's tracking uh, the effects of emerging contaminants in our water, such as the so-called forever chemicals, PFAS and PFOA, or maybe trying to recover resources and harness the energy that's available in our wastewater, the future in the field is very exciting. And there are thousands and thousands of dedicated workers constructing, operating, and maintaining, and planning all the infrastructure required to protect this natural resource made up of two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. Now, most people probably take for granted the clean water that's always available at the turn of the tap, and they don't think a whole lot about what happens after they flush. But imagine how different life would be without easy access to clean water, which is still the case, unfortunately, in several developing countries where some people have to walk more than a mile just to fill up a couple jugs and take home to be able to cook and clean. Water is essential to life, and access to clean water is now seen as a basic human right. As the demands of society put more and more pressure on this precious resource, we need to recognize the value of water and the role we all play in ensuring that clean water is available to all of us now and in the future. Thank you very much.